Joseph Dunn was the fifth and final victim of the shark attacks that occurred along the New Jersey shore in 1916. Joseph's leg was brutally mangled, but he survived the attack, and the doctors even managed to save his leg. This made Joseph the only victim of the attacks to survive. After the attack, the press covered Joseph's trip to the hospital. They did an interview with him, asking him about his experience. Joseph's recovery and eventual discharge from the hospital was covered in great detail. However, something strange happened after that. Joseph Dunn, the lone survivor of the most famous shark attacks ever, simply disappeared. In 2001, when Dr. Richard Fernicola wrote the book on the New Jersey shark attacks, he mentioned that despite his research, he had been unable to locate Joseph Dunn. How was it that the boy who survived one of the most infamous shark attacks simply vanished without a trace? He never gave another interview, never spoke up about the attacks. Did Joseph perhaps die an early death? What was the remainder of his life like? I decided to try and find answers myself. The only information that I had to go on was that Joseph was 12 years old in 1916 and that he had a brother named Michael who was 14 years old. This was a supposed fact that would later cause me extensive confusion. It was also mentioned that they lived in Manhattan and both brothers were visiting their aunt in Cliffwood, New Jersey the day of the attack. Not much else is known. I searched the New York City census records for a Joseph Dunn who was born in 1904 who had a brother Michael born in 1902. There were so many Joseph Dunns that the search was quite long. I knew I was facing a challenge. I came across a number of families who had both Joseph and Michael Dunns, but the ages didn't match what I had been told. After a few days of searching, I found a census record from 1910 that listed a Joseph Dunn and a Michael Dunn as brothers. But the ages would have meant that Joseph was 14 at the time of the attack and Michael was 18, not their reported ages of 12 and 14. I wondered if there had been a mistake in the ages all along, or perhaps I was chasing down the wrong family. It didn't take me long to dig up the 1920 and 1930 census records for this Dunn family. Joseph's father's name was James and his mother's name was Mary. He also had a number of brothers and sisters. By 1930, the family had moved from Manhattan to Long Island. I also found Michael Dunn's World War I draft registration. It listed his birthday and his address at the time as 124 East 128th Street, both great pieces of information. Using this birth date, I managed to find Michael Dunn's death index. He passed away on Long Island in 1976. It turns out that they never left the area. However, since Joseph was born after 1900, he did not fill out a World War I draft card. So I could not get an exact birth date, nor could I identify if any of the Joseph Dunn's in the death index were in fact him. I went on a hunch that I had the correct family. I figured if I could find Michael, I could find Joseph. I called the Historical Society on Long Island so they could do an obituary lookup for Michael. After a few months of no reply, I called back. The man informed me that he had checked for Michael's obituary and found nothing. I contacted the Queen's Library instead, but without an exact date of death, they were unable to fill my request for an obituary lookup. I resorted to calling just about every cemetery in the Queen's area in hopes of a miracle, but I came up empty. I noticed something one day that changed everything. There were only two Joseph Dunns born in Manhattan around 1903 that died on Long Island. Again, I took a risk and decided to get a birth certificate on one Joseph Dunn that stuck out to me due to his proximity on Long Island in relationship to where he and the elder Michael Dunn had lived at the time of his death. After six weeks of waiting, the birth certificate arrived and I had lucked out. The parents' names on the certificate, James and Mary, matched the names on the census records. This was the Joseph Dunn from the family I had found. I now had the death index and the month and year of death of this Joseph Dunn. If this was indeed the correct Joseph Dunn, he had lived to be 80 years old. 
I had always assumed he had died young because we never heard from him again after the attacks. So I did what I had done with Michael. I called every cemetery in the area and attempted to get an obituary lookup, both of which failed. Over the next few months, I began to get desperate. I tried to find Joseph's parents, his brothers and sisters. I even started doing fruitless searches in various newspapers such as the New York Times. I came up empty. It was terrible to have such good luck lead me nowhere. I decided that if I was going to get an obituary, I had to make a trip to the Queen's Library to look through the entire month myself. However, after nearly eight hours of searching the library, I came up empty. I decided that Joseph Dunn just simply did not want to be found, but I wasn't giving up. One day while searching the Matawan Journal, I came across a small article that stated that the Joseph Dunn involved in the shark attacks did in fact live at 124 East 128th Street and had a father named James. I was stunned. It was a perfect match to the address on Michael Dunn's World War I draft registration. I had had the correct family all along. Encouraged by this information, I decided to continue my search. I heard that the New York Public Library offered exact dates of death for all New York City residents in their death index. I made a trip to New York City. Inside a small room within the library lay the books, the last one published in 1982. Had Joseph Dunn died just one year later, this might have remained a mystery forever. In the book, I found a small record that listed a Joseph Dunn who was 80 years old that died on April 1st, 1982. It had to be him. It matched his death index perfectly. Armed with an exact date of death, I applied for a New York City death certificate. However, I was rejected without proper proof of relationship. I sent a request to Queens Library for a lookup now that I had an exact date, but again, they found nothing. I tried one more time to obtain a death certificate. On July 11th, just one day before the anniversary of the shark attacks, the certificate arrived. I went to Matawan Creek where the attacks happened on July 12th and opened the certificate. The mystery was solved. After a fall at his home, Joseph died in the hospital. He had been married to his wife, Eleanor, but they never had any children. I once again made the trip to Long Island to find Joseph Dunn's grave. In Farmingdale, Long Island at St. Charles Cemetery was where Joseph was said to have been buried. I walked into the cemetery office for the exact location of his grave, but Joseph Dunn had one more surprise in store for me. The woman at the desk told me where he was buried, but that him and his wife's grave were unmarked. I found the spot where he was buried, but it was just an area of grass. The picture could have been taken anywhere, but there lie the only survivor of the 1916 shark attacks who I had been looking for for almost two years. His life after the attack still very much a mystery. Why did Joseph Dunn never give any interviews after the attack? When the movie Jaws came out, Joseph would have still been alive. Why did he never speak up about the story after 1916? Perhaps he was a very private person. It seems all the information that I found on him indicates that. And perhaps it was just something that he wanted to put behind him. Joseph would have carried the terrible scars of the attack with him for the rest of his life as a constant reminder, and might have even walked with a limp. Perhaps that was the only reminder of the terrible event that he ever wanted.